Not on the icy shores of Parks Pond this morning. This morning I'm on the snowy shores of the Parks Pond. We have had eh, six, seven, eight inches of snow. I didn't measure it, hard to tell. But uh, I'm trying to decide if I should just let it melt or if I should move some of it out of the way. I'm thinking uh, this would be a good day just to wait and see how much of it melts. From what I understand, the weather is going to be better, warmer, sunnier, brighter. So I hope that is so. Uh, for our devotion this morning, I, uh, I happened to find a book on my shelf over here that, uh, you know, does. I read the back of the book first, so I, I, I just liked what the author said at the end. Now, the name of the book is Well Versed. It's by James L. Garlow. And as you can see, it says Biblical Answers to Today's Tough Issues. And it has a lot of good information in it, I'm sure, though, like I said, I have not read it yet. So we'll, we'll get into that. We'll read that. Also, uh, if you've watched some of the other videos, you've seen a different picture. I put a new picture up. It says, God bless America, and then has the Pledge of Allegiance. And certainly want to be uh, focused on our need today for God to bless America. Don't know where we're headed. Don't know what's going to happen. But uh, I know this. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. I know that the, uh, the Lord is for us. So, um be mindful of this. God bless America and pledge allegiance to the flag. That's uh, our new picture. I don't know if I'm going to do a new one every day, but it's certainly the new one today, so enjoy that. Well, anyway, as I said, this book that I found, I just want to read the, the last few pages. The subtitle is The Reason for Hope. And it starts right out, it says this, Jesus is the Son of God. So that's what we're talking about today, that Jesus is the Son of God. And good morning, Lauren. Good morning, Ben and Joanne. Good to see you folks with us this morning. And uh, I hope others will join us as we go along. But let's, let's begin with prayer and ask the Lord's blessing as we spend a few minutes together. Lord God, it's, it's good to know that you are Lord. It's good to know that you are sovereign that you are in control, that your desire is for us, and that you desire to bless us. And so, Lord, we just take these few minutes this morning together in these perilous times in which we live, with this ongoing crisis of coronavirus and, and the social distancing that we must have. Lord, it's good to be mindful of the fact that we don't have to distance from you. We can draw close to you in these times. So I pray, Lord, that would be what happens all over our land, Lord, that we would draw nigh unto you. Lord, as we consider who you are, as we look to your word now, we pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus is the Son of God. That's that's the premise. That's where we begin. Jesus is the Son of God. And uh, that's what the author, uh, James Garlow, at the end of the book, as he says, the reason for hope, that's the first thing, the reason for hope. And he says this, though he arrived in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, he pre-existed. He always existed as the second member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He did not have to be created. He always is, present tense. He is always. So that's the first point, eternally existing. And although we did not see him in human flesh till the Bethlehem manger, he did appear on earth numerous times in what are called Christophanies, or Christ appearances. Sometimes the reader does not immediately recognize him because of ambiguity or euphemisms, phrases such as the angel of the Lord, but he was in the Old Testament. He's all through the Old Testament. In fact, it's all about him. Now, when Joshua encountered the imposing man with the sword drawn in Joshua 5, 13 to 15, Joshua was understandably shaken. He, Joshua, was a successful general. 
the leader of about two million people. He was a man's man, not easily intimidated. Joshua asked the most practical question. Are you for us or our enemies? Neither the intimidating figure responded. I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Translate that, I did not come here to take sides, I came here to take over. Who was this one? This was the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. A modern day paraphrase of that passage would read, Lord, are you a Democrat or a Republican? Neither. I am in charge of everything, including political parties. So what does this mean? Does, does that mean, first bullet point in answering what does this mean? Does that mean this book is about a theocracy? No. We are in a constitutional republic and would like it to stay that way or maybe return to that. Uh, second bullet point, what does this mean? Does that mean that I am a dominionist? No, the dominion I believe is found in Genesis 126, where God gave to humanity dominion or stewardship over his earth. Does that mean I want to force my views on others? No, I want the presenta presentation of biblical truth to be so convicting and so compelling that people want to embrace it. Does it mean that I am trying to politically outmaneuver or outvote the opposition? No, I want the opposition to understand heartfelt truths that cause them to want to live for Jesus in every aspect of their lives, including the voting booth. Does it mean that I am pushing a particular eschatology? No, it simply means that I believe Jesus is king and I am part of his kingdom. Now, Joshua was not the only one who encountered this pre-existent Jesus. Gideon came face to face with him in Judges 6.21. And Gideon, also a skilled military leader, was so terrified that the Lord had to assure him that he was not going to die. Manoah. He also, in Judges 13, 19 to 21, encountered the one as well, and flame shot out of the sacrifice he had brought, causing him to cry out, we are doomed to die, we have seen God. Well then, Jesus arrived on earth, born of a woman overshadowed by God himself. By age 12, he was able to exceed the understanding of the PhDs gathered in the temple. Think about that. 12 years old, you know, for the kids who are watching, who see this, I want you to understand the temple. You're smarter than they are. And that's what he was able to do. So he was able to exceed the understanding of the PhDs gathered in the temple, the smart people of his day. And when he was called rough, uh, I'm sorry, when he called rough, tough fishermen, James and John, known as the sons of thunder, due to their rowdy ways, they dropped their nets and followed him. When he called the highly successful owners of a fishing company, Peter and Andrew, to dump nets, boats, and profits, they left it all and began following him. What kind of man is this? He is no wimp. He is no milk toast. He is a man's man. He told brawny, leathered outdoor workers to leave their operation him, and they did. Then came the miracles. First, he controlled time. He stopped it, reversed it, and elongated it, performing miracles of healing and even resurrection of the dead. Then he altered molecules, molecules and atoms. He fed 5,000 people from a dinky lunch of five slices of bread and a couple of fish sticks. Water became wine, and then Jesus walked on water. Think about that. Then came the transfiguration, when Moses, dead for 1,400 years, and Elijah, dead for 700 years, showed up. Peter, James, and John, the strong guys, were terrified. They fell down on their faces. Peter started babbling, not even knowing what he was saying. This is some Jesus. Then came the crucifixion. Do you know what he said about it? 
You can find it in John 10, 18. He said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Even in his death, he literally took on Satan and defeated him before the resurrection. So what about the time between the crucifixion and the resurrection? Where was he? What did he do? Scholars disagree on how to interpret 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19, but the Apostles' Creed says he descended into hell. Why go to hell? Because there is no place he can't go and no place that is not his. He went to hell as a victory lap. Abraham Kuyper was right, quote, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And then came that explosion of power called the resurrection that blew a massive stone right off the tomb and caused Rome's most elite military guard to fall to the ground like dead men. What a God. Then came appearances to more than 500 at one time, and the ascension in which he defied gravity and went up into the air. The two angels who showed up to explain said, this is the way he is coming back. Eventually, and maybe very soon, uh, when I, I see... My son Matthew sent me a, a link to a, a video by the uh, head of the United Nations. And he, he was a, he, obviously a globalist, but he's just talking about taking sovereignty from all the nations of the world and, and really wanting to establish a one world government, as we read about in Scripture, a sign of the end. And yet, uh, <laughs> I don't know that he'd be successful in this day, right now, today, but it shows you how a crisis like we're experiencing is an opportunity for some to seek to grab power. And we can see how the Antichrist will grab power someday, maybe soon. He also sent me a link this morning about how they want to provide some sort of relief to us Americans in the form of digital dollars. That's an interesting story as well, and a precursor maybe to the mark of the beast. Something to look at, something to consider, something to wonder about. Here, he writes, eventually, I think very soon, the rapture will come where we, the church, get to feel the gravitational pull melt away ourselves. If you don't believe in it, fine, I'll wave as I go up, and finally, the second coming of Jesus will come. He came the first time as a lamb and a servant. He will return as a lion and a king. John, the close friend of Jesus, told us what will happen. Hang on to your seat as you read this passage from Revelations 19, 11 to 16. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's quite a passage. Revelation 9, 11 to 16. Now a rider on a white horse, eyes blazing like fire, blood on his robe, a sword coming out of his mouth, armies riding behind him ruling with an iron scepter, and his name, King of Kings, all of them, King of all the kings, Lord of lords, all of them, Lord of all the lords, and we will stand before him. A book will be opened. It will be the book of life. If your name is in it, 
you'll go to the bema seat where Christ will be seated. A bema was a Greek term associated with competition. It was a raised platform where winning athletes got their prizes. Rewards will be handed out there for those covered by the righteousness of Christ. If your name is not in the book of life, you will grow, go to the great white throne judgment. But that is how it all ends. Or that is where it all begins, at least for you and I who are Christians, especially. That's where it really begins in eternity. I would like it to begin for you too. In fact, I would like to spend forever with you. Paul told us how to do that. And if you have a Bible and you want to open to Romans 14, that's where we're going to be. I'm going to read this, but then I'm going to get into the my Bible as well and look at it in a little more detail. But Paul told us how to do that. Romans 14, 10 to 12, it says, For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Every person will come to see that Jesus is God. For many, it will be too late. I don't want you to be one of them. Right now, bow, either literally or figuratively before him, and let your mouth reverently yet boldly say, Jesus is Lord. That's it. That's what it requires. But looking at this here in Romans 14, in what James Garlow put in his book, in verse 10, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. And that's where the book stopped. But verse 13 says this, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. And that, that was the thing that was Speaking to me as I was looking at all this uh, yesterday and this morning, everybody is going to stand before Christ someday. And some of them are going to do it still re rebelling against him. And my concern is that I don't want anybody to be able to say that I said something or I did something that prevented them from accepting Jesus as Lord. That's a big concern on my heart today. I want whatever I do, whatever I say, however I act, I want it to be in such a way that it does not cause somebody to reject Christ. I don't, I don't want to be a stumbling block or a cause to fall in a brother's way, in anyone's way. So let us resolve today that that's who we're going to be. Those that serve the Lord, those that love the Lord, those that uh, just obey his word and follow him. Thinking of Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord desires of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before our God. To love justice, to, you know, to live justly. That's, that's to do what is right and, and, and uh, love mercy, you know, to be merciful to others, even as God has been merciful to us. And then to be humble, to walk humbly before our God. It's a good thing to consider today. And so, brothers and sisters, may God bless your day today. Don't know where we'll be or what we'll be discussing tomorrow, but I hope this has encouraged you, and I hope you will ponder what God is saying to you today. May the Lord bless your day. Until tomorrow, God bless you.